Thank you all. I'll, I'll say a few words here as an opening like I did with the first two panels. Uh, this is really a, um, first of all, thank you to the panelists and for the audience who have just arrived or the ones who have been here with, it, with us already this morning. This uh, conference came together really as a continuation of the uh, 25 or so town halls that uh, we have done around uh, the district. Those uh, are, you know, we just schedule town halls and whoever shows up, we have a conversation with them. Uh, this is a little different. Uh, we invited folks who have expertise in, uh, in uh, different industries and in job creation. And uh, we wanted to ask people who have created jobs about job creation. And I thought that made sense. And uh, we have had two fabulous panels so far. Uh, the way this rolls is uh, I um, will have the panelists, we, we organize them from A to Z, uh, and we'll have the, the panelists uh, introduce themselves, where they work uh, and what they, what they do. And uh, then I'll just uh, uh, throw out some topics and we'll just start casually discussing and see where it leads us. Uh, that approach has, has worked the first two panels and we're gonna try it again. Um, if you have a question, we welcome your questions, but uh, we're not going to have a mic and, uh, and have time for people to stand up. So just if you will, uh, John over here who is waving, uh, he has some question cards. If you have a question, he will bring you a card and you can write down your question and um, he will give it to me and we'll make sure that we incorporate the subject into uh, the discussion. So. Uh, without further ado, I think we will we'll get going. If you just want to introduce yourself, we'll just go right around here. Very good, Congressman. Good morning, everyone. I'm Joe Adams. I'm Vice President of Public Affairs for Union Pacific Railroad uh, from Houston, Texas. I've got uh, responsibility for government affairs and media issues in uh, Texas, Louisiana, Arkansas, and Oklahoma. It's a pleasure to be here, and I've enjoyed the uh, proceedings so far. They've been very informative, Congressman. Good, thank you. So you were here for the first... Yeah, for One. both. Both of them, that's right. right. Congressman, I thank you as well. I'm Jay Cheshire, President and CEO of the Little Rock Regional Chamber of Commerce, and we appreciate the opportunity to participate. Thank you. Well, also, thank you, Congressman, for this opportunity. I'm Clay Gordon. I'm Executive Vice President with Naples Construction Services uh, here in Arkansas, and uh, appreciate the opportunity. I'm Lane Kidd, President of the Arkansas Trucking Association, which represents uh, our huge uh, transportation industry in this state. I'm Paul Latour with the Port of Little Rock. Ron Matthew, Executive Director of Little Rock National Airport. Thank you for inviting us. I'm Ronnie Mobley with Mobley Contractors. Thank you for inviting us. My name is Patrick Schick. I'm uh, Vice President of Prospect Steel. Uh, thank you, Congressman Griffin, for having us. Uh, my name is Scott Swinney. I'm General Manager of Parker Beechcraft uh, here at the Little Rock Airport. And, uh, uh, my name is Steve Williams. I'm chairman and CEO of Maverick USA here in Little Rock and have been involved in infrastructure conversations from a, a governmental affairs standpoint uh, at the national level through the Transportation Research Board and national academies, et cetera. So appreciate the opportunity to uh, be here as well, Congressman. Thank, thank you all, all for being here. Uh, we got a couple who are running late or um, uh, we will they show up, they can just join us. Uh, we have been talking a lot this morning uh, about the three main themes uh, of this conference. Number one, what are the obstacles that you see uh, in your business uh, to job creation or in your industry? Uh, and I know we've got uh, some folks that work for the port and work for the airport representing them here, which are a critical part of, the, um, uh, of our job creating engine excuse me, here in central Arkansas. So the first question is what obstacles are there uh, for you? What opportunities do you see? And then um, we are trying to answer those questions so we can figure out uh, with specificity what public policies I can help with uh, to the extent uh, the federal government uh, can be involved or is involved. And um, we had a lot of discussion with the first panel uh, about uh, regulations. There's a lot of talk about the EPA, in fact, uh, and um, it seemed that uh, folks in the energy industry, uh, but per uh, particularly in, in agriculture, 
uh, they, uh, they had a lot of concerns about EPA regulations, not the substance necessarily, but the timetable for implementation. A lot with, with regard to a lot of the issues, they said, look, we can get there, but we can't do it overnight. So the first thing I'd like to do, just to get the conversation started, uh, and, and anybody, you know, uh, feel free to speak up, is just if we could go and uh, go around, uh, and if you have some obstacles, whether it be a regulatory obstacle, uh, whether it be a law that has been passed or something you're waiting uh, on uh, to pass, uh, whether it's uncertainty uh, related to the economy, uh, I'd like to hear what, what in your business the obstacle is. And I would, I would say one more thing. I saw an article that um, it was about the trucking industry conference in, in Dallas, I think, over the last few days. That's where we've been. Yeah, and the headline of the article was, uh, trucking industry sees uncertainty uh, as one of the big uh, issues with uh, job creation. And uh, so uh, I think that um, that's the sort of thing we're talking about here. And we'll, we'll start with you over there if you want to. Yes, certainly, Congressman. I uh, took the opportunity to provide a fact sheet uh, about Union Pacific's operations in, uh, in Arkansas. There, there are some on the back table. And, you know, I think the, the most important issue is we have uh, uh, 2,700 2, uh, good paying jobs in Arkansas uh, associated with transportation uh, uh, on, along the railroad. but uh, the, the Locomotive shop in North Little Rock uh, is a uh, is a major employer. Employs about uh, 815 people in, in high-paying jobs, and uh, as you can see from the chart, one of our major commodities coming into the state is coal, and we're very concerned about uh, EPA regulation, which uh, would uh, impact uh, the ability of utilities to continue to use coal, and that has to do with uh, with some of the uh, onerous emission standards, uh, regulation of the uh, ash uh, uh, that is created as the, as the coal is burned, uh, and uh, the move toward mandatory fuel switching, which would uh, force utilities to move from coal to natural gas. Natural gas is relatively inexpensive right now, given the recent discoveries. Whether it will stay that way is, is a question, but even at the low prices of uh, natural gas today, uh, coal is still cheaper and provides more economical uh, utility rates, electric rates, and obviously that's a major factor uh, when you look at industrial jobs in an area. So I would, uh, would start with, uh, with the EPA uh, regulations is something we're concerned about. There are others as well we can get into later. We're a very heavily regulated industry. Uh, there are a lot of federal law laws impacting us, and we've got uh, a number of issues that we think have impact on, on jobs. But, uh, but having said that, uh, I'm, I'm pleased to say we've uh, added uh, over 100 new jobs in, in Arkansas over the, <coughs> over the last year, and uh, hopefully we'll continue to see growth. Thank you for that. Go ahead, Jay. Congressman, I, I would echo what Mr. Adams said in regard to uh, regulatory reform and review, uh, but would center my comments initially on the uncertainty format. Uh, a major international site location consultant and I were speaking uh, a few months ago, and he was talking about the fact that prior to last November's election, there was absolutely no activity going on, uh, domestic or international from that standpoint, in terms of major economic development projects because of the uncertainty. People were just sitting on their hands and their money. Uh, he said, in interestingly enough, the day after the election, that his phone started ringing, but it was primarily from international firms looking at investing in the U.S., uh, but that over the course of time, because of the uncertainty issue not getting any clearer, uh, that a lot of those projects had, had also been put on hold. And, and I think a piece of that goes to even um, what the NLRB has been doing, especially over the last six months. Uh, when you take a look at the rulemaking process, uh, they have taken uh, existing labor law and turned it on its ear, uh, labor law that's existed for 50 plus years, uh, being done from an administrative standpoint that they couldn't do legislatively 
uh, and it doesn't seem like anyone's able to get that under control. So I'm hearing constantly from businesses that are already here, number one, and those that uh, we're talking to about moving to central Arkansas, that that's a huge issue because they don't know what the rules are because rules that have been in place, again, in some cases up to 50 years, are being changed seemingly overnight and, and without a whole lot of uh, public input, even though you look at the Boeing case and you look at what's happening there with their ruling, you look at their, um, uh, their provider ruling in terms of the persuader ruling that they, that they have, uh, taken a, a stance on the micro union issue with the specialty health care case, uh, the notice posting rule. Uh, I can go on and on with the secret ballot side of this as well. It just seems like businesses are, are trying to determine where and when they're going to have control over the aspect of how to run their business versus someone in government explaining or pseudo government explaining how they should run their business. Congressman, I, I would uh, echo everything that Jay just said, um, and uh, really, I guess, uh, some things that I can add to it as far as obstacles for job creation uh, for our industry as a whole. As a, as a building contractor, uh, a lot of our clients may be health care or education, uh, private sector. So really, you take the uncertainty that's out there in the marketplace, that's what affects us. Uh, that's what affects a slowdown in, in turning loose of construction projects. Uh, your previous panel of the healthcare industry, obviously that's a major client of ours, and uh, their uncertainty is, uh, has, has impact on them willing to expend capital for infrastructure. Um, a couple of other factors that I will note, just uh, not necessarily for building construction, but for uh, construction industry as a whole, uh, infrastructure investment, um, highway funding, transportation funding, obviously is a huge impact, potential for job creation. And I think that's uh, certainly something that we need to take a hard look at. So. If I, just to echo uh, Clay and your comment on infrastructure, probably the, the quickest way to create jobs today, at least in, in transportation, uh, would be in uh, Congress uh, adopting some type of infrastructure funding plan. And to go to Joe's point, you know, the railroads are fortunate in some ways and, and not in others, but, but one thing the railroads do very well is capital spending on their infrastructure. And they'll spend between, I think, five and six billion dollars as an industry this year to keep their tracks maintained and improved. They do that because they depend on tracks to deliver freight. Trucking delivers 85% of the manufactured goods in this country, but we don't own our track. Our track is, is highways, and we depend on you and we depend on legislators to improve that infrastructure. The only way you improve infrastructure is with tax dollars. And the, you know, the phrasing we track, Steve and I track all the time of public-private partnerships and the fact that we need to pursue those you know, th those are, that's a code phrase for tolling. And if we look at the most efficient way to, to finance infrastructure, it's not with tolls. Tolls, you know, 35% of a toll fee is eaten up in the cost of collection. Uh, the fuel tax is historically, and even up to today, the most effective, most cost efficient way to fund highways. And we have not had an increase in the federal fuel tax since 1992 and it's time we had one. I guess my comments would fall in the same two categories of infrastructure and regulation. But let me be a little more specific. In the area of infrastructure, right out that window, right out that window, you have a mode of transportation that will take you anywhere in the world. It'll take you to China, it'll take you to Europe. The Corps of Engineers is about $500 million short on doing what the railroads do every year, and that's taking care of it. That thing is nearly 40-something years old, and we have not funded, we the government have not funded the maintenance of that river. And we have one of the newest rivers in America, so you know the good news is we're not in dire straits, but the bad news is we're not keeping up with the, with the routine maintenance. 
The second thing that would help this river and help job creation in this area is from the Oklahoma State line to the Mississippi River using the Corps of Engineers' own soundings, it's 13 and a half feet deep, but it's only authorized navigation to nine feet. So we compete with the Mississippi River and we compete with the Ohio River and they're at 12 feet. We keep asking for authorization to go to 12 feet. We've been authorized the project and the big bucks are spent in Oklahoma, but, but we haven't kept up with the maintenance that we need to do the 12 foot channel, but in the area of regulations, yeah, Patrick Schick has a plan out at, out at our port. He does not pay flood insurance because he's not required to. Since 2006, we've spent about a half million dollars to make sure that our levy is certified. But the levy immediately adjacent to us didn't. So FEMA's erased it off the map. So the backwater, when you erase a levy with a pencil, but not in a real world, comes within just about a quarter mile of his plan. Now FEMA says, well, everybody, even if you did certify your levy, everybody that's in the quote 100 year flood, which we would be if there were no levy, but there is a levy, may have to pay flood insurance. I mean, that's nuts. You have the largest industrial park in the state of Arkansas that's put in almost a half a billion dollars in new investment in the last five years, and boom, we're gonna make them pay flood insurance because of, of some regulation uh, that we don't know. Uh, so, Regulation, infrastructure, I think will be a recurring theme that you hear the whole time. Well, I guess one final comment, Wellspun sits at the port, the Indian pipe plant, makes all the pipe for the Keystone XL pipeline project. In the last two years, they've been waiting on federal approval to go through the state of Nebraska. They still don't have the approval to build the pipeline. So we hear all the rhetoric about our, our dependence on foreign oil and you know, how are we gonna solve our energy problem here at home, but we can't even build a pipeline to cross Nebraska. Right now it's being trucked, it's being railed, it's being barged. What, what's the problem with the pipeline? <coughs> I wanna welcome John Burkhalter. Thank you for thank you, John. Thank you for being here, sir, I appreciate it. Well, we're just going around letting folks sort of tell us uh, off, uh, what their top priorities are in terms of obstacles to job creation, and uh, we'll come back to you in, in, in just a sec. Go ahead. Thank you, Congressman. The, the airport is uh, a little bit different. Uh, we do have a really good system in place in terms of the uh, FAA AIP reauthorization where we use user fees to fund the system. Unfortunately, we've not had a reauthorization, a multi-year reauthorization since uh, 2007. So. One of the things that makes it difficult is our ability to predict what work that we're going to have on our capital projects, and uh, and we have some stops and starts uh, because we've had a number of uh, continuing resolutions. But it, you know, if we could have a multi-year uh, reauthorization, then the FAA could work with airports on multi-year projects and not you know, on a month to month basis. And so that would bring some predictability and back into the system yeah. and, and certainty. Uh, the other part of that is the uh, PFCs. PFCs are local funds. And uh, there hasn't been an increase in the PFCs for over uh, 10 years. Um, and, you know, the industry um, believes that there ought to be an increase or at least an indexing to inflation or indexing to construction costs because so that you can maintain uh, the level of work that we're doing. The, the airport is an economic engine to the community and every dollar that we take in, we spend at the airport. And the perfect example is the $67 million project that we've got going on right now. We've got about 300 or so people that uh, are uh, working at the airport. It's a multi-year uh, project and it's primarily funded with uh, PFCs, and we did receive some stimulus money uh, as well, full disclosure. And so we're very pleased with that. We are putting people uh, to work. The economic impact of the airport in general is about $1.2 billion a year, and we exist for that purpose. I mean, the airport uh, is a uh, economic engine to the community. We're a transportation hub, and we're also a place of business. 
and the one that we take most seriously is the economic engine to the community. And we are uh, relied upon and, and prepared to certainly do our part, especially in a down uh, economy, uh, to uh, put money into the community and build our infrastructure. We're prepared to do that, uh, but what we need is a, a little bit more help in terms of the PFCs just keeping up uh, with uh, inflation because, you know, 450 10 years ago is not 450 today. And it's, and the construction cost 10 years ago is not the construction cost today. So uh, the neat thing about our system is that it is funded almost entirely through user fees. Um, and that is a really good model. There are no um, state tax dollars that, or city that come to the airport. But we do make a really significant impact to the community, in fact, we just did a, uh, an analysis, and conservatively speaking, uh, we pour back into the community about $14 million a year in uh, taxes to the, uh, the state, the county, and the city. So, you know, we exist for exactly that purpose, and to be an economic engine, to be a, a transportation hub, and we believe that our citizens uh, should not receive a facility or operate out of a facility that's second to anyone. We should never say that's good enough for us. We should say it's the best facility, it's the best service that we provide. And my commission, and I agree with them, just really don't believe in the concept of good enough. So uh, that's how uh, we feel about it. Those a couple of things would be extremely helpful to us because they would add some predictability back into the system. You can get into long-term projects with with the uh, FAA, which is very difficult to do now because we're going CR to CR. Sure. Thank you, sir. I was with a gentleman yesterday that uh, I want to share something that he uh, shared with me. There are at this time five groups in this country that are wanting to build uh, power plants. And of course, they can't get permits to do that. As far as some obstacle to stop these jobs, that's a big one. Uh, our current administration is uh, totally against it, of course, and, and wants to go green in every way. Now, these are big projects. These are huge projects that could be going on all over the country. For us here locally in Arkansas, I agree with what, uh, what has been said about the infrastructure funding and the highway funding. This is uh, something that is closer to home here for us. And uh, if, if these areas were funded, of course, it would create work, which would create jobs. Uh, the uncertainty in our economy is, is uh, slowing all these things down, I know, as the other gentleman has said here. And Paul's correct in the area of the river. Uh, our company is uh, uh, working on three uh, dams on the river at this time, and it's very underfunded. Uh, some of these, we're, we're working on a dam out in uh, Oklahoma. And the hydro equipment in that dam is uh, 60 years old and, and is in terrible shape. And we're going in and, and working on this dam, and there's so much that needs, needs to be done. But that's a perfect example to tell you how underfunded it is that it's gone this long before anything has been uh, repaired on these hydro Thank you, Congressman Griffin. Um, my, our biggest obstacle right now to get to job creation is the United States government. Yeah, I agree. Without a question. We have to have the ability to get people in the door to hire them. They don't want to come in right now. They're sitting at home. They're happy. I'm sure there's people out there that are hurting. But right now in our, in our business where we need welders, fitters, painters, fork truck drivers, men of that nature, women of that nature, we can't get them to come in the door. Life's made too easy for them right now. Um, the extension of the benefits is obviously a political play. We believe at Lexicon that we have a position right now, we've been trying to hire at, at a minimum 50 welders for the last year. We can't get them to come in. Um, I'm sure Navajoltz has had some of the same issues in, in a lot of their projects statewide. Uh, on a national level, when we talk to our customer base, we ask them, you know, why aren't you guys getting in the business right now? It's, everything's cheap right now to build. Steel's cheap, concrete's cheap, 
Rebar is cheap. It's not going to get any cheaper than it is right now. They don't know what's going to happen with car check. They don't know what kind of benefits they're going to be forced to pay. They don't know what's going to happen uh, with the EPA regulations. So they have no incentive to go out and spend any money. The leadership right now is telling the United States, you know, we've got all these bubbles up in the air, but nobody's re reaching up and popping them and telling us what we're going to have to do. So our biggest problem right now is we employ 304 locally. I probably need to be employing 450. I can't get them to come in the door. It's not easy work. It's not great work, but we pay a fair wage. We pay, we pay above what's standard in the state of Arkansas for manufacturing. $800 take-home pay for us versus a $457 unemployment. You know, those guys are looking at it saying, okay, maybe I spend $100 with gas a week going to, going to work. Maybe they're coming from Sheridan or Pine Bluff or Hot Springs. They got $25 worth of incidentals, whether it be stopping to get something, lunches, whatever. The difference there is not enough to make them want to come back, and it's got to stop. We need, we need workers, and, and, and nationwide there is a shortage according to the American Welding Society, of over 250,000 welders. The average age of a tradesman in the United States is 55 years old. 55 years old. So we keep hearing about the baby boomers are going away. Well, in the construction business, it's a problem. We need people. We need people so we can build America. And that's what Lexicon wants to do right now. We just need the, we just need the help from the federal government to get us back up on our feet so we can go to work. So, uh, just to clarify, so, so the number one thing that uh, the federal government could do to get out of your way is? They need to, A, police the people who are getting benefits. We're big, we believe they need a drug test. If you're going to go get uh, unemployment benefits, you need a drug test. I have to drug test people to work in my facility. Why is the United States government not drug testing them prior to them receiving their benefits? The second thing you need to do is police these people as to are they actually going out and looking for work? Are, are they doing it? They, I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that are hurting. I, I'm sure there is, but we don't see it. I sit at home and watch the nightly news just like all the other people on this panel, and I can't tell you how unbelievably frustrated I get night in and night out because I know what we're trying to do, and the success of Lexicon is based on the success of our people. I gotta have enough people to work to cover my fixed cost to make me competitive in the workplace. If I don't have it, I'm not gonna be successful. I won't be in business. Very good. Uh, a lot of what surrounds the corporate aviation is, uh, of course, the economic uncertainty. A lot of the companies are holding out of their capital and so on. Uh, the rhetoric we, we hear uh, from certain individuals surrounding the corporate aviation causes these guys to hesitate before purchase. Uh, uh, we live and die by the uh, manufacturer of these aircraft. Um, uh, we've got to encourage these companies to go ahead and, and spend that capital and buy these, these corporate assets. Uh, the jets are just an incredible uh, tool for, for economic development for these companies. So uh, I would say the major major deal is to get rid of the stigma around owning the corporate jets. A fantastic tool. Well, I'm working on that. <clears throat> I want more people to buy jets that are serviced and outfitted here. Uh, that's more jobs. And uh, I know you want that too. Uh, and uh, I am happy that the aerospace industry has gotten a foothold uh, in central Arkansas. And uh, I'll, I'll talk about uh, that gentleman's, that you were referring to, uh, words on, on jets. I'll talk about that a little bit in the context of tax reform, but go ahead. I think the, uh, you know, the trucking industry is a good example of, of, of an industry that is reportedly leads people in and, and out of recessions. And, and we just left our national convention, and the barometer there is that it, people are generally optimistic. They're cautiously optimistic. But they, specifically to your question about the obstacles about job creation within our industry, and currently the trucking industry is short 300,000 drivers currently. Um, and the, the interesting thing about that is that everything would lead us to believe that that's this position to go much higher. Um, but we have a different twist, I believe, in regards to what a lot of analysts are talking about getting rid of regulation. 
you know, we're, we're a little different. Uh, I think uh, we as a nation have done a very poor job of, of yes, the industry has been deregulated economically, and, that's, and that makes sense. But we've also deregulated the industry from a safety perspective over the last many years. And, and I think we've been tightening up on that. And a lot of the regulation that I think is going to be required is on its way. And we support that as an industry because it's about public safety. And I think, uh, so I'm not asking to be regulated less. I'm asking to be regulated appropriately. And in this case, it's probably more. Uh, but it, because it's about literally uh, safety. Uh, much like uh, I'm, an, I'm an optimist, but I'm also a realist, and I, I know that there's an awful lot of really good people in this country that if we're not incented properly, they won't necessarily always do the right thing. And a lot of that has to do with manufacturing and, and oil exploration and everything else. So I think there's an appropriate amount of regulatory oversight that must be in place. The trucking industry, which I know a lot more about than any of the other areas, uh, I say is, is is like that because um, it's appropriate that we uh, have the expectation that uh, our drivers are drug and alcohol free that they in fact are well rested uh, that in fact uh, that they're well trained and I can tell you after having spent my life in this if we don't hold everyone accountable they won't always be the way they are or the way that we want them to be so I, I think we have to be careful not to throw regulation out the door just because it's been an obstacle for some difficulty for many, and, and appropriately so is my point. Um, Lane made the comment about the uh, infrastructure investment, and this is very, they're connected, because our inability uh, to invest properly in infrastructure, we're so far behind in this country on investing in lane miles, uh, we'll never get caught up, and we won't, can't afford to get caught up. Uh, so we're going to have increased congestion, which is going to have implications to the environment and to free commerce and everything else as well. The cost of transportation and everything related to transportation is going up dramatically. Everything is not cheap. Every, our costs are moving up so dramatically. The cost of one of our trucks has moved up 50% in the last three years, 50%. And that's just one of many items that I can talk about. So we're seeing a very, uh, uh, right, costs are moving up fairly dramatically. The point I want to make is that I, I personally have $10 million worth of trucks setting out on, in North Little Rock without drivers in them currently. I can put people in them, but it isn't going to be pretty. So it's about putting the right people in them. But we have to have the ability to operate on the most efficient roads that we can and what is getting ready to happen because of all of, and Lane alluded to this, because of the people having the, do not have the political will, whether they be Republican or whether they be Democrat, uh, to invest in infrastructure by raising our taxes. The average state fuel tax from an administrative to apply numbers to what Lane said is a half of 1% of an administrative fee. At the federal level, it's less than 2%. The cheapest toll road is 30% and it goes to over 55% from an administrative burden. So with very tight resources in this country that are ever gonna be made available to us to invest in anything, we should for once and for all be very frugal in how we choose to administrate that investment. And I really believe that in the trucking industries on record is that we will do whatever it takes to increase our fuel taxes and pick a number of whatever it takes to solve it but let's do it. We're wasting time. And we can't get anybody to belly up to the bar and, and, and make it happen. But it isn't because we've said no. Uh, we're begging to do this because we are the ones that have to deal with the implications of a failure to invest in infrastructure. John, uh, you want to go ahead? Just tell us what uh, your obstacles uh, to job creation, what you believe is your biggest obstacle to job creation. I think I know one of them. Um, uh, but, uh, and then we have a, uh, th this will serve as a great uh, list of things that, that we can talk about uh, over the rest of the hour. Go ahead. Thank you, Congressman. I do apologize for being late. No problem. I was at my Highway Commission meeting, which has to do with truckers, of course, and we did have a bid letting this morning. We uh, let about $80 million in contracts, and we were estimated to go with about $88 million, so we, it's evident that the contractors are 
hungry, they need work, and which will create a lot of jobs for us. Uh, Congressman, I applaud you for inviting me. I'm honored to be here with everyone else today and get my opportunity to tell you what I think about jobs. And I'll probably ramble a little bit because I'm going to talk on the public side and the private side a little bit. But uh, one thing I want to visit with about before I forget it because it's at the top of my list, we just discussed it. On November 8th, we have a, an opportunity to go to the voters to vote on the extension of the Garvey bonds, which is extremely important. It'll produce, you know, about $575 million worth of bonds, which will create 24 to $28 million, million jobs in this state. So it's very critical that we pass it. It's not a new tax, it's just a continuation of the tax to leverage the federal funds that we get on bonds. So I encourage everyone to uh, go back to your community and solicit your friends and your neighbors to vote for that. Uh, what I see is, as Steve was saying, we our funding mechanism for highways in this country is so far short, it's, it's systemically flawed. Uh, it's based on fuel tax and as people conserve and save money, we have less and less revenue for our highways. Uh, as a businessman, I'm in my 50s, and I consider myself probably a dying breed, and there's some other gray hairs here. I give her Steve and Patrick's father, Tom, Ronnie Mobley. Uh, you know, I don't see the young people coming into our industry. And uh, infrastructure is extremely vital to our state and our country. You know, we, we're grad we've got about 24,000 students at Fayetteville this year, and one of the questions that I asked last week of Chancellor Gerhardt was, how many are we able to retain? And you know, we're probably losing 40% of our college graduates out of state because we do not have the jobs for them. You know, my opinion is we've got to continue with infrastructure because that's the only way we're going to get companies to locate here. They've got to have the infrastructure. They've got to have the ability to move their goods. And then we can hopefully keep more of our uh, students because you know, basically we're spending state dollars to send them out of state. What's the solution? It's very complicated. But I think we learned during the Great Depression that we cannot restrict the money supply completely. You know, we are going to have to continue to tax ourselves. We know that as businessmen, people in this community. But also, we need to encourage people to go back to work. We don't want to create another generation that thinks that there's, they're going to live off of unemployment benefits. I think a lot of businessmen are concerned about that. And I think that's why we're kind of a dying breed, because I don't see a lot of young people want to step into where my shoes are what I've done in the sacrifices. But yet, I'm great. it's great to be American. Arkansas has been great to me, and I've been blessed to be here. Uh, Congressman Griffin, you make yourself available to me on a daily basis if I need you the most uh, easy to get a hold of and talk to Congressman, and I really appreciate that. I appreciate your efforts. Uh, I do think we have many, way too many partisan politics going on in Washington. I think citizens of this country are tired of it. I think we will continue to see that Uh, we've got to put America first. We've got to put our people back to work. Jobs will solve our problems, but we have to go back to work. And I know we're going to have to, there's going to be more red ink. We know that, and I don't believe that we cannot raise the deficit. I think you're going to have to raise the deficit, but we need to make sure that as many dollars as possible we spend on putting people back to work with real jobs. And we've learned that infrastructure, we get something once it's done. During the Great Depression, I mean, people wanted a job. No matter what it was, they wanted a job. They feel better about themselves. And when it's done, we've got something to look at. There's still some great WPA programs that I learned to swim. I think, I think it was called a place like Lake Nixon that was a WPA project. There was a lot of great projects that were done. Um, Garvey bonds are important to the state. Uh, regulations, I'm with Steve. We've got to be regulated, but every, now I'm going to talk privately about developments I do, every project I look at now, I've got to wonder if I'm going to get to build it because are the regulations going to stop me? And I've got to admit that I pass on over 50% of the projects that I would like to do because the, 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 the burden, the hurdle to the regulations. Uh, and I know that every time a new law is passed, someone's got to enforce that law. But let's make sure that we put good regulations in place that are also user-friendly to business people. I do have major concerns about where the country is today and what we're going to do to fix it. I don't think I'd want to be in your shoes right now. I 
you've got to make extremely tough choices because you know the world's looking at us now. We're just not a, 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 a the world is a global environment now. What happens in Greece impacts us, but you've got to make tough decisions. It's not about just getting reelected. I know you've told many times that you're up there to do what's right. I believe you're already trying to do what's right, but uh, I, I want to probably come back. And well, thank you all. And the way we've done this in our earlier panels is we just have a conversation. I, you know, uh, you all have, there's lots here to discuss. Let me start out, if I could, and, and, and just say a few words about regulation. Um, yeah, we're always going to have regulation. We need regulation. I want my kids to have clean air and clean water, and I get all that. I think most folks that I have talked with in, who are job creators tell me that the ramp up in regulation over the last few years has been unprecedented in their view. Uh, <clears throat> that's not something I've come in contact with in my previous business, uh, so I rely on what other people tell me. I hear a lot about the EPA and, um, and what they're doing uh, with regard to uh, power plants and, and other things. And uh, a lot of what we heard this morning is that they're not, a lot of the folks on the panel weren't against the regulation. They just couldn't comply immediately. They need time to change their business model, to adopt new technology, to get there. Otherwise, you, you can kill. You can kill cement industry uh, is one that's been at risk. You can kill and shut down some of these energy plants. Um, and so uh, I think one of the things that we've proposed that I support uh, is something called the RAINS Act. And what it does is it basically says right now Congress authorizes the writing of regulations by agencies. And then they write them, they get comments, and then they publish them. What we've said is you, we're authorizing them in the first place, so you ought to come back to us and we vote on them to approve them before they can go into effect. And that way we're making sure that the agencies are following what we intended in the first place. Because without congressional authorization, agencies can't regulate anyway. So that is something that, uh, that we have talked about. Um, I'm, I'll show you here this chart, and this goes to, to several points. Th these are all infrastructure projects across the country. And the, the key is over here, nuclear, renewable, coal, transmission, and natural gas. And I think I get this iPad to work. Um, this chart is a way to, this chart is described. Um, these are all projects that were stalled, stopped, or outright killed. Stalled, stopped, or outright killed. That's a lot of projects. That's a lot of infrastructure. Those are a lot of jobs. And I think that there are a lot of different reasons for this. A lot of it is litigation. Uh, people don't like the idea that something's going to be built near them, so they, they take something that was going to be built in 1990 and they stop it, and 10 years later they're still in court. That's does anybody want to comment on the litigation? Does anybody run into that at all? I know that, I think you have, John. Anyone want to comment on that? Has that been your experience? From, from the railroad standpoint, it's more an issue of getting the permits, the local permits, when you want to build a yard or something like that. It's NIMBY, not in my backyard, even though it, it, it might make a great deal of sense. I do want to comment on the map. I'm glad that the wind project off of uh, Hyannisport is on there. Yeah, I, I remember that one. <laughs> one of the most famous. There's a, a liberal NIMBY project for yeah, you. Yeah. One of the most famous not my backyard projects. Um, any of, anybody else uh, run into anything like this? I know, I, I'm, maybe you're not in litigation, John, but I know that you are. Yes, uh, but I've been, you know, I've been lawyered up close to litigation on projects and Usually I will avoid litigation if possible. What, what I see as far as in the regulations is where it's a city or a state or a, a community that they've passed rules and laws and regulations. You know, I think the 
a certain degree. I guess a rule can be violated, a law cannot. But I see so many times that we pander to uh, special interest groups that are more vocal than, let's say, a Ronnie Mobley who's up there working on a dam, trying to make a living and make payroll. Because that's typically what I'm doing. I'm working. Uh, I don't have time to pander or spend time to lobby. And uh, I think that that is one of the places I see in my private life as far as development is getting killed. Now on the public side, I know those usually get lawyered up and definitely get litigation. But, uh, well, l l let me ask you this. Um, in terms of uh, the, uh, I, I want to pivot from you because you've got an interest in what's going on with the river and talk briefly about the river and then we'll get into to some of the uh, uh, some of the highways and some of the other stuff. But um, the river is obviously a, uh, an incredible asset uh, to this state and one that we have used, but I believe greatly underused uh, for years and years and years. Uh, I am one uh, who supports uh, dredging uh, the river uh, or getting certification and dredging where necessary to go to 12 feet. I've gone round and round with the, um, the Corps of Engineers on this issue, and uh, I do think that uh, we're going to get there at some point. Uh, maybe not in my lifetime, but <laughs> we'll get there at some point. But I support that. I support a fuller utilization of the river, and there's a tour. I think it starts today where uh, folks are going up and down the river just to emphasize the public relations deal, to emphasize the opportunities that can flow from it um, uh, with regard to uh, well spun. I toured well spun, uh, I don't know, maybe three weeks ago and met with their folks. And in fact, one of their guys is going to be on our manufacturing panel uh, this afternoon. And they told me in no uncertain terms. They picked that location, and you already know this, they picked that location because they count on that river. They count on, the no offense to rail or trucks, but they count on the capacity of those barges to handle the massive amounts of steel that they bring in. And, um, and they are a selling point. And I, I know that, you know, I wrote a letter earlier this year on the Keystone Pipeline just trying to weave some of these comments into, into my, uh, my comments, but uh, I asked the federal government to please get that approved. The federal government did their part. Finally, we got that approved, uh, and now it's, it's holed up, uh, uh, stuck in Nebraska with the governor and a senator from there, and, and that's something we're working on next. But well-spun jobs, you're right. They are directly related to whether that pipeline gets built, and then all the other jobs that go with that. But uh, John, I don't know if you want to talk about it here, but, but John has been working on what I would consider infrastructure uh, right here on the river. And uh, you want to, do you want to yes, talk I, about I, that absolutely. from the private side? <laughs> I've, in, I've invested about five years of my life. I, I've, I've been a developer and a contractor and an inventor, and I saw an opportunity to really build a fabulous project for Arkansas. It wasn't just about me, it was about Arkansas. And I'm a boater and I'd like to have a boat on the river and it would help justify my sin. But I grew up in uh, Sylvan Hills. The only time we really came to Little Rock was when we came to the doctors and we crossed the Broad River. And the river was just in the way. And typically I've watched that river since a young boy. I used to put a canoe in over in Burns Park. My parents didn't really know it, but we were in the river with it along the bank. We haven't developed, and I've seen many, many other cities as I traveled, and I've had companies throughout the United States where their rivers are developed. And just my parents live down in uh, Orange Beach, Alabama, and there's an intercoastal there. And there's a place called Lulu's, Jimmy Buffett's uh, sister, actually. I it. and it's amazing how there's a marina there, because I'm talking about building a marina, but the marina people, the tugboat people, the Coast Guard, everybody seems to get it. They all seem to be able to navigate and work it out. But uh, you know, I've had a lot of pushback uh, from um, several organizations here, some of them that are represented here today, that are not interested in seeing that, that marina developed. It would create a lot of jobs. It's a first phase is $50 million. Um, it, 
It's an amenity that would help the city grow. East End is in dire need of changing, and it would, with, with the land that the So Falcon Jet, I was involved with the So Falcon Jet. I was on the Economic Development Commission. I was involved in the Wells Park with Jay. And had we not had, uh, Paul, we had to have clean water, electricity, natural gas, but we had to have the river. And uh, the river is a great natural resource we have. With the hurricanes, I think more and more companies are gonna realize they need to locate up river to get away from the hurricane. We saw that when Hurricane Katrina came in and you know, a business goes down for 60 days. I can imagine Patrick Steel business going down for 60 days, what it would do to your numbers. But uh, this would be a great project for Arkansas. It, it's, uh, and it's actually where I think that private business needs to go. It's a joint uh, venture between the public and the private. There's a million dollar infrastructure grant that's been awarded to this project, not to me, but awarded to the project from the federal government and through the Department of Interior to help build transient boating base. The Arkansas Game and Fish Commission's involved with building a uh, launching ramp. The city parks are involved with the city park that I'm actually gonna build for the city. My match is about four and a half million dollars. And Congressman, what I get out of that is a little over 100 boat slips, which if you look at the numbers, it's, as my accountant would tell you, it's a ridiculous transaction that I'm looking at doing. But I, it's my opportunity to give back. Arkansas has been good to me. And over, once the whole project's built, it will be approximately 450 boats, but also it will have a multifamily, which will allow people to live close to where they work. We've got to get where we actually living and working and playing closer. But you've been working with me on this project, and, and I would like to see other organizations in this state join in to realize that we can work together in Arkansas. It's just not about one selfish interest over the other. And I think if we would look to other states, they've figured that out, Congressman. They, they're, all work, they're all working in tandem, and for some way they're able to, to coexist. And just to clarify, that would be uh, along the river here, sort of in that direction. Yes, sir. I, um, you have uh, Clinton property that Heifer International owns a small piece. Then you have the fraternal order police, and then the city owns a piece of property. I'm leasing that property, but it's about a 16 and a half acre development, which will end up being a $250 million project, which I think will revolutionize and change East End. I think to a certain degree, East End has been disenfranchised. The ability to get there by road is very difficult. Uh, I don't see skyscrapers over there, but I do see three story buildings, and I see many multi-family developments where people can actually work. But it's really a great gift. It's one of the greatest gifts I can probably give to Arkansas. And I, I've worked on it for five years. I know we're working diligently with the Coast Guard right now and the Corps of Engineers. And I think sometimes roadblocks are, are thrown up just because it's easier to say no than say yes. And we need to learn how to say yes we can and yes we will in this country. Let me, uh, let, let me, uh, I'm going to try to transition now, try to get it out of the water up onto the land. Uh, uh, in terms of the, um, in the, the infrastructure funding that was in uh, the first the stimulus, we've heard about shovel ready, and I know the president's made jokes about it not being as shovel ready as he thought it would be and all that. Um, what, did, did anyone here uh, benefit, I, I know you all got some funding at the airport. Uh, what sort of funding was received? I know you got some at the port. Others got funding from that. Was any of it, uh, 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 did any of it here at the table relate to roads? Yes, we had, okay. the fact is we just broke ground on uh, the uh, Bella Vista Bypass, which is a Tiger Grant associated with the stimulus. Okay, so you're talking on the public side, yeah, absolutely. Okay, from the highway commission. Ours was rail. Yours was rail. Okay. okay. There were there were several national rail pro projects that received money. Create in Chicago, which is a major terminal where uh, overpasses were constructed so the lines didn't intersect at grade. Uh, Coltman, California, was an overpass. Mm -hmm. Tower 55. There were there were a number of those where uh, the railroads put up 50 or 60 percent. There was some local and some federal money, but I, I think what we're seeing as we go further along with Tiger 1, Tiger 2, Tiger 3 uh, is less benefit and less bang for the buck. Uh, the, 
projects come in. It's been a great opportunity for consultants who write up applications to, uh, to make a lot of money uh, because there are a lot of applications that are filed, but not too many are successful. Well, just here in your district, and John could confirm, but the major renovation of the I-430, I-630 interchange is, is stimulus. Is that right? Yeah, right. Part of it is. Part yeah. of it, yes. In our business, uh, we, we did see a small pickup in uh, bridges, primarily railroad bridges, that uh, typically those projects, from what we understand, would have been shelved. Mm -hmm. But because of the funding that was able to help those individual projects, that was a small blip on the radar. Right, uh, it, it, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, it was a, uh, infrastructure was a very small percentage, old, in the end, of the close to trillion dollar stimulus. That's the way I understand it. I mean, if we would have spent, you tell me what the impact would be. If we would have spent a trillion dollars on our interstate system only, <laughs> what would that have done to our interstate system? <clears throat> You could, I'm, have I'm replaced, about, you could have replaced all the bridges that need to be replaced. I'm talking about a trillion nation, dollars worth of bridges that need to be replaced. Right? Yeah, right. Nationwide, according so, to Patrick's so, right, but we would have sure gotten a head start on it. So, <laughs> yeah, so basically, if you would have taken the stimulus that was spent and is now gone, and you would have spent it on all of the stuff we talk about, then it would all be fixed, or we would be in the process. Um, I, I think the problem a lot of us have with what we're calling stimulus two, one of the problem we have with a lot of the first stimulus is in this state, it was estimated that 30,000 jobs would be created. The government says 4,800 or 4,500 were created at a cost of $300,000 a job. Well, if you would have given me a checkbook, I could have written a check for 30 grand to a bunch of different folks and created 10 times the jobs that were created. So I think that track record is what gives a lot of us pause in, in what the government says it's about to do and what it actually does. Uh, I am very supportive of uh, infrastructure as a key to economic development. When I talk to Caterpillar and I ask them, why did you come here? They said, Jay Cheshire, no, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> but when I say, why did you come here, they said, I said, why, you know, you hear a lot about Mexico, people going to Mexico, whatever. why didn't you go here or there? Why did you pick us? Because I want to identify why they picked us and make sure we keep that advantage. And they say, skilled workers, particularly working with Pulaski Tech uh, on a whole host of issues. They say stability of government in the United States versus Mexico. Uh, they say infrastructure. And they don't necessarily say them in that order. Uh, but infrastructure here with the um, intermodal transport, with uh, the interstate right here, with the ability to easily move from rail to trucks, uh, that's a selling point. And, um, and I, I'm, so I, I totally get that and I am, I am supportive uh, when I know that we're gonna get what we're told we're gonna get. Uh, one thing that I would ask, I want to ask y'all's opinion on with regard to infrastructure funding is, um, well, what's on here? Um, Majority Leader uh, Cantor has talked a lot about the 10%, I think it's a 10% set aside uh, in transportation funding that has to be uh, where 10% of funds available uh, have to be set aside for museums and bike paths and, and can't be spent on interstates. Uh, yeah, here it is. Uh, you, you, you get any input on that? What if we eliminated that, not that those things are bad, but that when times are lean, maybe you would want to decide, instead of being mandated by the federal government, maybe you would want to decide. We don't want to spend that 10% on a museum when our bridge is about to collapse. We would rather, in this instance, spend half of it on the bridge and give some of it to the museum. Are you, all, are you familiar with what I'm talking about? Can you comment yes, on that? But I mean, it's ports. I mean, the, the, the federal money that comes back to the state of Arkansas, yeah, that some of it is designated and we don't have a choice on where it goes, yeah. but it's, it's ports, it's, uh, it's bridges, it's bikeways, uh, it's safety. 
Uh, now, how you change the formula, that's beyond me. Because um, I, I, some of those are really good programs. We need those programs. It, but yeah, we are not keeping up with uh, safety infrastructure issues in this country at all. I, my, my read of this is that this is something other than the safety. This says that there's 10% set aside of federal surface transportation funds for, quote, museums, education, and preservation, which those are great things. But when you don't have extra money and you're deciding that or this new bypass, I guess the question is, wouldn't you want to have would it help you to have the flexibility uh, to make that decision on your own? Because that is something that a lot of folks are advocating that we do away with so that the states can decide what they want to spend that money on. Well, I think Congressman and Lane and Steve both touched on this. The, the, the fundamental problem is that there's not enough currently, whether you're looking at the Highway Trust Fund, whether you're looking at infrastructure dollars that are being discussed and debated in Congress, all of that still isn't enough to do mm -hmm. the projects that we're talking about that are, are the basic infrastructure of, of roads, uh, taxiways, bridges, uh, port-related, river-related. And, and, you know, I think anyone in the room would say that this bridge out here is a phenomenal quality of life asset, as is the Big Dam Bridge, as is the 14 miles of continuous bike trails uh, and, and, and jogging trails that exist here now because of that partial investment. Mm -hmm. But the reality is if you were to take all of those away, you still wouldn't have 43630 done. Oh, sure, sure. And so I think the fundamental issue is what are we going to spend on our infrastructure because it's crumbling right before our very eyes. And, and when are we going to get serious about doing that as opposed to the next stimulus plan du jour to try to get us out of a short-term economic issue? Uh, so in terms of the long-term sustainable funding, uh, we have talked, I've talked with Lane about this, uh, I think I've talked with Steve about this. Um, the fuel tax obviously um, is at the top of the list uh, for, uh, for Lane and, and others. But we've also talked about the issue of track. I mean, it's a use, it's a use fee uh, tax. And we've talked about the difficulty of tracking as uh, cars get better gas mileage <clears throat> and use less fuel. Uh, how or do use you electricity. Use electric use cars. Can we, can we talk a little bit about that? Because it seems like that's where we're heading. And will an increase uh, in the fuel tax, I mean, an increase in the fuel tax is not going to address that. It will. Yeah. yeah I, I would. Or will it? Uh, it may will. I, may I comment on, on that? On the electric? The v, VM, VMT uh, taxes uh, have actually, you know, there's, everyone's enamored with the ability to, to do this. Uh, state of Washington, I'm sorry, state of Oregon completed a project uh, that I was privy to and there's a lot of I mean that is a solution that will exist but it's many 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 years out and hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars worth of technology investments that are not anywhere even on the drawing board yeah. now we have to have a obviously we have a we need to have a long-term energy strategy obviously for this country and it and and this is a part of that there, but there are some short-term solutions that are going to be a lot more practical, and that's the reason Elaine and I are so passionate about just raise our fuel taxes, and, and we'll figure the rest of this stuff out when we can. Your, your Class A truck population's fuel economy is not necessarily going to change dramatically in the years ahead. But, but specifically as it relates to it, the context that we have to understand, and as bad as the economy has been, but our, our nation's economy will double in size over the next 20 years. And if you think things are congested and, and, and uh, actually I'm the chairman of an organization, the American Transportation Research Institute, and we just released the worst bottlenecks in this country. I mean, if you think they're bad now, and you can name them Austin, Texas, Atlanta, Chicago, Gary, Indiana, the list goes on, it's scary places to be. The, the part that we have to understand is in the last reauthorization, 
the 36 worst bottlenecks in this country receive zero dollars on federal funding. But the mechanism that we use on how we collect funds, whether it's ever enough, and how we actually put it to work in states. And I think Arkansas does a good job. This isn't a criticism about the state of Arkansas, but they're not all, not all states are created equal. But the fact is, is that in, in the, con the caveat that the trucking industry places on our support at raising our federal fuel tax, and they may be talking about doubling it or tripling it or whatever it would actually take, would be, I don't think we'll ever necessarily fix the system that we ha we currently have. It's been in place, you know, since the federal fuel tax was created. And diversions are always going to exist. But in the meantime, all the other additional revenue that we could talk about collecting should have specific uses. Freight, freight corridors or highways of national significance. Spend that money differently. We've demonstrated that we don't know how to spend the other money. But we're, it's actually chunk change compared to the amount of money that we need to be investing in all infrastructure, not just highways. But if we do not have that underlying strong foundation of infrastructure, the rest of this doesn't really matter, quite frankly. So you're, you're saying not only the amount of funding, but, but, but there are, I'm sure, uh, Lane, and, uh, jump in if you like, but you have specific, there are specific structural changes that need to be done to the formula. Um, and and you know, I'm sure Arkansas does a great job, but you're saying some states are not, once they get the money, the money that they have is not, uh, so it, it's not being spent properly. So in some instances, you're wanting more top, you're wanting more strings uh, with regard to the way they spend that money that comes from the federal government. Because again, I'm not, I'm not questioning the, the first layer. Let's just say that, that that's left alone. But let's say there's another layer of funding that goes on top of that. And, and this is where I'm in a, a federal mode here of talking about the fact that these are federal roads. These are, in fact, a federal network that serves our nation. And in fact, there has to be a strategic uh, connectivity to all that and, again, to all other modes as well at the same time. I'm just saying that there's an appropriate place for the state to be involved in spending a certain amount of money, much like in local communities as well. But there's also a federal place, in my opinion. And, and I believe that that is the condition that the, that the National Trucking Association has placed upon their support of doing whatever is necessary, of being in the context that this money is committed 100% to solving the problems, and that <coughs> is building bridges and expanding lane miles and making the and designing these differently we're the least competitive nation industrialized nation today in regards to <coughs> truck size and weight policies the least efficient we're already in the last place and as we invest in this infrastructure we need to catch up with the rest of the world and that is connectivity to other modes as well so but and we have to you know, and I know that there's a uh, political ideology about we need to cut government, we need to make, uh, you know, government smaller, or we need to spend less. That does not and should not apply to public infrastructure. You know, don't let your colleagues give up the uh, interstate highway network to private companies to lease and toll. You know, don't, don't let your colleagues give up the interstate highway network to states to determine how it should be spent. This thing was, our interstate highway network was always imagined as a federal network to be funded by federal dollars. And I've been in this business a long time. And you have a situation where the trucking industry of America that currently pays about 50% of all of the federal taxes for highways is walking up to a member of Congress with dollar bills saying, please invest this money on our highways. Mm -hmm. And because of political ideology, the congressmen are saying, no, nah, we don't want your money. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd say a couple of things. Uh, again, we spent a trillion dollar stimulus and almost none of it went to do what you all need done. Okay, so that's a trillion dollars, 42% of which was borrowed. Uh, 200 billion was borrowed from China and almost none of it went to do what you're talking about. So that's, that's what we got, uh, number one. Number two, I don't know anybody and there may be there, but I don't know anybody in the House who wants to uh, get rid of or give away or uh, the, the, the interstate, uh, the Eisenhower 
interstate system. Uh, I believe it is a structural backbone uh, of economic development, and uh, I think most people I talk to get it. Chairman Micah gets it, I think. Uh, I'm not on the Transportation Committee, but uh, from all indications I've seen, he gets it. Uh, and so, uh, I think, is lunch next? Okay, I'm gonna take a little liberty then, because I don't eat lunch. Um, We've got some box lunches for those of y'all who wanted them, but I'm gonna go a little long on this if I can. Um, so I, I just assure you, uh, uh, the, the the big challenge here is, um, is is a challenge for the whole country, and it's not just transportation and infrastructure, uh, which is, if I haven't been clear for the press that's here, uh, I understand it's very important. Uh, and, um, and I believe that uh, uh, we ought to be doing everything we can to remain competitive. I get that. <clears throat> the broader issue, uh, and I talked about with the other panel, and I, I like to bring it up because it is so critically important to understand the pressures that are pushing. There's a, there's a better chart near the end, uh, but it would take too long to get there, so I'm going to try with this is basically the federal budget as we know it. And this is discretionary spending appropriated every year. This is mandatory spending never appropriated. It just happens because it's in the law. And, uh, you know, there's good stuff all around up here, okay? This is not about whether stuff's good or not. Now, this is a, about a three point, this is 2010 numbers, but it's about a $3.5 trillion budget. We take in about two, a little over two trillion in revenue. So about 1.5, 1.6 is in the red every year, getting bigger. So we're borrowing 42 cents of every dollar. If we build a bike bridge, we're borrowing 42 cents of it of every dollar and some of it from China, just on the whole. About 15% of all of our debt is, is Chinese help. Just to put that in perspective, uh, about 50% of our debt is foreign held. Okay. So here's the problem. And this applies in healthcare with NIH funding, which is important. It applies to all the many things that we need to be investing in. Many of those come from the discretionary side. Transportation money um, that may be special money um, for this project or that project. Non-defense discretionary. The, the issue is that 20 years ago, this big part of man, what we call, we call it autopilot spending because it happens whether we appropriate it or not. We could go away for decades and it still happens. This does not. This is when we have CR fights and possibility of shutdown and all that. That's only this. That has nothing to do with this. Because this stuff, if it's not approved, it doesn't happen. That's the appropriations process. Appropriators have no control over this. It's not appropriated funds. So here's the issue. 40 years ago, this, this part of the puzzle, which grows automatically, without anybody making it grow, it just grows. Because people, if they meet certain requirements under the law, they get that, okay? Um, and some of it, it paid in or whatever. But anyway, 40 years ago, this chunk was about here. It was about 20% of the whole circle. And then about 20 years ago, it was about 40% of the whole circle. Now it is, 60% of the whole circle. If we stay on the road we're on, it then becomes 80% of the circle. Until in 2050, it's 100, this right here is 100%. What does that mean? That means the Department of Transportation does not exist. It means the Department of Defense, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, does not exist. Department, if you're balancing your budget. Obviously, you can borrow, which we have. Department of Labor, Department of Commerce, HUD, you name it, go, they completely go away. So the, the, I say all this to say 
what you're seeing happening is this stuff is going to continue to expand automatically and pinch this side. And this stuff is politically, as you know, I voted to reform them, but most folks won't do that. Okay? Um, these are politically difficult to discuss for a lot of people. Um, and so what happens is this continues to grow and puts pressure on the discretionary. And because discretionary comes up yearly, and because it's right there in front of you, and you have to deal with it, or it doesn't get appropriated, this is where a lot of the cuts come from. And so, but here's the scary thing. When you're pushing on this, you're squeezing out infrastructure. You're squeezing out all, uh, NIH funding. You're squeezing out defense. You're squeezing out every education, whatever. Everything we need, or well, not everything, but a lot of the stuff we need is being squeezed by the growth of this side. And um, that, the, the scary thing is, you could theoretically take this entire discretionary world out and eliminate what you know as the federal government, and we would still be in the red. That's the scary point. So that's not to, that's not to, uh, uh, to justify anything. Uh, that's just to explain, and I went over this in the healthcare one too, because you see Medicare and Medicaid are a big portion of this. And a lot of that's just demographics. The baby boomers who were once working, paying in, many of them are starting to move to the other side. So I just say all that to say that that is just, that's why there's this pressure. And the, short, the, the more pressure, the harder the decisions because the fewer the dollars. And it just keeps going and going and going and going and going. And, and that's why when, uh, when we, that's why prioritization is so critical. And right now we're still able to do that a little bit. But at some point it gets to where there's nothing left to prioritize. Yes, say, sir. say, Congressman, the way the super committee works, and if we don't get a positive result or Congress doesn't approve it, does a 10% just come out of the discretionary side? Well, it's going to be over a trillion dollars divided between defense and, um, uh, and Medicare. And Medicare. Uh, basically. I, you know, we're hoping that something comes out of there. But what I try to tell folks is even if we get whatever they should pull out of there, even if we get something good out of that, that is just a minuscule down payment on, on this issue. And I think it contributes to part of the uncertainty, but, but I, I want you to know that I understand how important this is uh, to economic development. I, I, I get it. Um, and I think a lot of other people get it. Not everybody gets it. I'm sure you've had talks with some of them that maybe you don't think get it. But, but I think most folks get it. And I know all the representatives of both parties in Arkansas get it. I can tell you that. And we're lucky to have one of them, uh, Rick Crawford, on transportation. Um, uh, but before we wind up, I want to uh, we I want to talk a little bit about aerospace and your comment earlier about aerospace. Um, aerospace is like the other industries here, critically important to our economy here. And the beauty of aerospace is not only are they good paying jobs, but it's high tech stuff. And we are privileged uh, that uh, that y'all are here. And I know you have, you have talked with me about the certification issue. Uh, do you want to explain a little bit more about that and where, what issue, if any, you're still having with that? Actually, uh, your office actually helped me out real quick, real efficiently. I was, I was very pleased with that. Uh, it, it boils down to the inconsistencies uh, within, the, uh, within the FAA and the different regions. Uh, at any different regional office, you, you might get a different ruling on what you can or cannot do. Uh, in, in the instance I brought up to you guys, uh, just kind of enlightened a big issue that, that helped me resolve a local issue here. Uh, but the inconsistencies across uh, the different sites really pose a hindrance uh, in, in operation. Is this just a, an agency regulatory uh, glitch more than anything? or? 
hard for me to explain really the inconsistencies we see across that network uh, within the feds. But when you see them and need help, you let us know. Uh, uh, let me mention, uh, we got a question here, we got a couple questions. I think I sort of hit on the funding issue, but um, how do we replicate the vertical alignment the state has in aerospace between academia and industry uh, the way we've done with other, um, or how do we do that in other key Arkansas industries? And I think, I think your point more broadly is uh, Caterpillar has benefited greatly from its work with Pulaski Tech. Uh, and um, we had the uh, uh, UACCM here uh, today from Moralton, um, and they have worked very carefully, closely with uh, natural gas industry. And uh, I guess, uh, are there other, I guess you're, you're asking, I think it's Walter, uh, you're asking, are there other opportunities with other industries where we could do that? Jay, I know you want to speak to that? Yes. Uh, in, in fact, you know, Arkansas has come a long way especially under the leadership of Governor Beebe in, in that regard. Uh, prior to Governor Beebe becoming governor, we had some issues with different um, entities around the state, not necessarily training for specific needs within those areas. Uh, governor Beebe created what he called the Workforce Cabinet to address that issue because he recognized, uh, especially during the Toyota recruitment process, that that was a problem. We've been able to take that uh, with Marianne Shope, who was here earlier, I don't know if she's still here, with Pulaski Tech, uh, with others, including UALR, and then obviously some of the other two-year schools, not only within Central Arkansas, but across the state. And Caterpillar's a good example. Uh, DeSoe Falcon Jet's a good example of where we've gone into those entities with the people that, that need those positions identify what the specific skills are, identify what the technology requirements are, implement that within the public entities themselves, and then create a, a training program that allows for folks to come out of those programs ready to go to work. With specificity for that with, job. Very, with specificity and a lot of hands-on uh, work from the private industry uh, representatives themselves. Because I think sometimes we expect the public side of the house to just know what uh, Patrick Schick needs, for example, at Lexicon, when in, re in reality, the welding that he's doing there today is, is in many cases far different than it was 15 or 20 years ago when a lot of these instructors learned how to instruct in, in that training method. So we, we've come a long way. We still have a ways to go, but we have some bright spots. And I, again, my hat's off to, to both the local institutions, the two-year and the four-year colleges across Arkansas, because they get it and, and they recognize that that's the only way that we're gonna be competitive going forward because we can have wonderful infrastructure, which we need to work on. We can have a great quality of life, which we do and we need to continue to work on. But for this state to grow in the next 10, 15, and 20 years, we're gonna to have to have the people the skilled people required to compete in the global marketplace. It's no longer about us in Oklahoma. Yep. Yep. It's about us in China. Yep, yep. Let me ask you this, who is the next, uh, what's the next marriage between, uh, I think that's what you're getting at, what, what's the next marriage that you see between uh, the private sector uh, and, um, and industry and uh, an educational institution? And by the way, we've got Pulaski Tech, I don't know if she's married, she'll be back in a minute. We've got Pulaski Tech on the panel, on the manufacturing panel this afternoon to talk about the relationship with Caterpillar. The, Congressman, the, the good thing about this process and how far it's come in the last several years is that it's whatever the specific company and industry sector is that's needing that type of training done. We've gone away from cookie cutter type, this is our welding program or this is our uh, sheet metal program or this is our technology program to Here's what the industry needs. Here's what the specific mm -hmm. company needs. And we're gonna teach that. And so it's not necessarily who's the next, it's what industry the next one will come from. And you'd use that as a marketing tool. Absolutely. Uh, and, and the fact that they are flexible. Uh, we've got Pulaski Tech or, or the others who are ready to meet your needs. And and, 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 and whether it's HP, whether it's LM Wind Power, whether it's Wellspun, whether it's Caterpillar, whether it's any of these other numbers of companies that have made Arkansas their home in the last several years, 
they themselves become our best marketing sources because they're singing the praises of the local two-year colleges, the local four-year institutions who have stepped forward and said, whatever it takes for you guys to be competitive, we're gonna provide that service. And that's what Caterpillar said Amen. when I, I asked him that. Yep, John. Congressman, before you wrap up, uh, you kind of told us about this freight train that's coming at us in 2050. I'm not too sure I'm interested in a box of lunch. I may be more interested in going outside and throwing up, but mm -hmm. could you, uh, what is the solution? I, I know you guys have got one or you're working on one. So, you know, this is about our children. What, you told us the problem, how do we sure. fix it? Sure, well, uh, my belief is, uh, and I think if you, if, uh, if, you, if you listen to the healthcare panel, uh, I won't speak for all the people on the panel, uh, but I will generalize. I think it's fair to say everybody on the panel understands the um, the, the spending issue uh, and the budgetary issue there. I showed in that uh, first panel, uh, I showed a quote. You asked, so I'm going to, you don't want to ask questions because I'll talk all day. Uh, let's see. This is a quote from uh, President Obama. If you look at the numbers, Medicare in particular will run out of money and we will not be able to sustain that program no matter how much taxes go up. I mean, it's not an option for us to sit by and do nothing. Now, um, the plan under the Affordable Care Act is when the money runs out, it just starts making cuts automatically under the IPAP, the Independent Payment Advisory Board. Okay? Um, so that's not a good option in my view. This is what Senator Lieberman said. The truth is we cannot save Medicare as we know it. We can only, we can save Medicare only if we change it. Now, um, most of that, most of our debt problem, um, if you had to point to one thing, and there's not one thing, but the biggest issue is demographics. And it's a good thing. People are living longer, okay, that's great. Um, but what you had is you had this massive population relatively that were working, paying in, uh, not taking, and they were supporting a small population. Well, as that big population moves to the take side, the my generation, the birth rate of my generation is not big enough to support with what we're paying in that, the new, the big one. And the issue is people do pay in. I have Medicare taken out of my check every month, um, you know, like everybody else. Uh, the issue is, though, the average family, the average couple pay in about 100000 to Medicare over their life. And they receive about 330 back. I'm not a mathematician, but that's the issue. And now we have 10,000 new people going on Medicare every day. While we were sitting here today, we've probably had 5,000 new people going Medicare. And so the issue is, how do we save it? How do we save it? And that's what you asked me. Um, ultimately, we're going to have to be able to discuss reform without being demagogued. I voted to reform Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security. I've already had you know, uh, been attacked relentlessly, not because of the, not because my plan differed from somebody else's, but just because I even had something. So we get, and, and I, I, you know, I, I was, I'm willing to do that. If I uh, can't, you know, if I'm not rehired because I said we need to repair those things and I'll be fine, get to see my kids more. But, but the point is, we have got to get to a point where everybody at the table knows the, the truth of what those two statements were from the president and old Lieberman and are willing to translate it into policy. Uh, you know, I am, I'd like to see the super committee tackle some of these big, bold issues because yes, we need to do a lot of stuff to create jobs and, and we're talking about that today. But the one thing I keep hearing through the panels, panel after panel, uncertainty. And a lot of that uncertainty is because of that graph I showed you. People aren't, they don't want to, you know, my view is, from what I've heard, and I've done 25 town halls, 
uh, is people understand that we don't have to fix it today completely. You don't have to have a balanced budget today. It's not going to happen. But you've got to get on a trajectory. You don't have to go from New York to L.A. today. But you need to know that you're on the right interstate heading toward L.A. And you've got to have an estimate of when you're going to get there. And that's what's lacking right now. There is no plan. I know. There, there is no plan in place on that right now, and um, um, you can't say, "Well, let's deal with that, this issue, that issue, but not the debt." They're all interrelated. Tax policy, a more competitive tax policy, which is a great segue. Just real quickly, and if you got to leave, I understand. But I'm going to go a little more into lunch, into the lunch break. Um, one of the things, and I'll make this quick. Quick. One of the things that is on the table is, and is discussed a lot, is a fundamental tax reform. How many of you pay in your business, pay taxes as a corporation as opposed to LLC? Corporate, you pay corporate tax, corporate tax, corporate tax. Okay, so about half. Or do, do, do the others of you pay pass through as a pass through entity, LLC, or, okay, individual tax, okay. Um, well, so on the corporate tax side, what you have heard a lot about um, uh, at, at, uh, in the aerospace industry is getting rid of deductions, loopholes, as, as some have called them, um, deductions, exemptions, credits. They're all kind of different things. A lot of them we take advantage of in our personal life, uh, mortgage interest deduction, for example, charitable deduction. Um, so most of the models, whether it be the bipartisan debt commission model whether it be uh, the ones that have been floating around the House and the Senate, um, most of them, the one I supported in our budget, most of them on the corporate side take our record, world's highest corporate tax rate and move it down to a more competitive international, internationally competitive rate of mid-20s. In doing so, you know, a lot of people already pay less than that anyway an effective rate after they take all their deductions. I think GE paid zero. So the goal would be to eliminate a lot of those deductions um, and have a steady, stable, competitive rate that you can count on from year to year. Because if you don't have that and you have all the deductions, some corporations may pay 21 year, 30 the next year, 10 the next year, and they can't plan. So what I've asked a lot of job creators who said, wait, don't take that from me. What, you know, I've asked them, if you lost your pet favorite, very helpful uh, deduction or exemption or, or credit or whatever, what would, the top, what would the rate have to be? And that's, that's something that I'd like to discuss with you all in the aerospace industry. And, um, because none of this is set in stone. This is a conversation that people are having about simplifying a 60,000 page tax code and getting at a more competitive, a rate that's more competitive internationally. I read yesterday that 75 countries have revisited and lowered their corporate tax rate over the last four years. 75. Why? They want to be competitive. Japan did it last year. We used to be second highest, now we're first. Um, so, I would ask you to, we don't have to reconcile this here, but I'd ask you to, to, to crunch the numbers and say, what would it look like in a universe where I don't have some of the deductions I take on the corporate side, and, but I'm paying a set rate of 23, and I'd love to further this discussion with you, because that type of input is real important right now, because this is what is being, um, what is being discussed. And a lot of us believe that we can increase that through pro-growth or competitive tax code, we can, we can, uh, we can increase revenue. Congressman, I, I, I think uh, a lot of companies ag agree with that. There's an organization that's been formed in Washington that I know includes the railroads, FedEx, UPS, companies that employ lots of people, and, and we feel that we'd, we'd be able to employ more jobs would grow if we had such a system yeah. and didn't, didn't have uh, uh, investment decisions in, uh, influenced by tax considerations mm -hmm. rather than what's best for, uh, for, the, for the company and its employees. 
Well, I welcome y'all's input on that. Thank y'all so much for being here. I appreciate it. I learned a bunch. And, uh, and thank y'all for putting up with the extra time. And we're going to have, uh, we'll just break for lunch. Have a